Again, I want to make sure that for me, from what I'm coming from, from a safe space standpoint, everyone can ask a question, anyone can, can, um, can pose a question, share a thought, or, um, or, or bring something to the table, right? This is not, this is not a, uh, a very rigid structure in, in communicating, right? I'm, I'm, I'm simply going to kind of set the foundation uh, and, and kind of go through, and I'm, I'm following the mic, yeah. If anybody needs a mic and wants to speak, they can use a microphone. But I'm just going to kind of go a little bit, you know, and set the set the foundation of some things. Again, not all things, because I'm I am in I am in no way in no way a, um, a historian, but an understanding of how how we kind of got to where we are now, right? And in terms of the United States of America, a lot of those things always start with you know the the, the slave trade, right? Uh, slavery, the, ensl the enslavement of of African people, and just understanding how that is tied within our countries and our laws and our policies and how those things have kind of helped perpetuate what I'm going to use, uh, institutional racism. So does anybody have like, does anybody have like an idea of their own definition of institutional racism? I'll, I'll set a definition for the group, but I'm just curious to know. Sure. Well, Mary Ann knows that I wanted to say this. I have to tell you that, uh, first of all, Mary Ann, Ron, and I go back to high school. So 58 years ago, and John Motley owned one of my heroes back to class, I guess, 60. We were 62. He must have been 60 or 58 or 54. I don't know. I don't know what he was, but it doesn't matter. Sure. Uh, I, I really yeah. never understood systemic racism until Mary, uh, I thought about it, until Mary Ann sent me a book about racism. Um, when Ron and Mary Ann and John and I were in school, there was systemic racism going on and I didn't know it. What systemic racism is to me is either through government interference or lack of rules imposing or allowing, suggesting that, that racism is acceptable. Since I'm an attorney, Plessy versus Ferguson would be a perfect case. You can have separate but equal schools. That was that decision until Brown v. Board. So that was a case, in my opinion, of systemic the court system saying that racism was acceptable. And my phone just rang. But that's what I see. I see it as part of the government or those in power either doing something or not doing something. Not doing something would be if you know that you're redlining districts where you can't sell to black people. Or if you know there's a, a levit town where there are restrictions, you can only sell, sell, send or sell property to white people. And that's systemic, where the government controls it, or with deed restrictions when the government does nothing about it when they should. And John sent a good thing about the racism in the South, and it's very, I did listen to it, although I won't admit to it. I did listen to it, and it was interesting, but that's the way I see systemic racism, as opposed to just racism. Big difference. Yeah, the definition you wanted to Yeah. I'm gonna let Mr. Phil go. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Jason. I look at racism <laughs> with, with the context of one race being in a position of power over another race or races, subsequently putting those other races in a position where they're marginalized or, and disempowered and disenfranchised and with total transparency I think part of the problem is who you have defining the race who you have defining that term because to be quite frank with you it's like to me if anyone's equipped to identify what that term should be a, defined as is the people who are the recipients of it not the perpetrators mm. so if anybody is going to define that term it should come from the people who are being oppressed marginalized and on the receiving end of the racism, not the perpetrators. So it's like, you know, so that's, that's, that's my lens. So in that context, to me, black people can't be racist. Now what we can be is we can be bigoted or we can be prejudiced because the word pre prejudice has the prefix pre and then judge to, to ju make a judgment about someone before you know. We can do that, but in, in terms of Oh, you're being racist? No, we can't be that. We can be biased and we can be partial, 
but in terms of racist to me racism is 1619 brothers and sisters being brought to this continent and then being subjugated to treatment that had us as a, a, a second-class citizen ergo the three-fifths compromise saying that we were three-fifths of a human being via the Constitution to me that's what racism is it's, it's, it's putting a race having itself in a position of power putting other races in a position where they are dependent on that other race for its very survival so that I mean that's 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 my lens all right. All right. Did, you, did you miss everything I said? Okay. There was a, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. There was a, uh, um, a lecture, and it's on YouTube, and if anybody wants to be directed to it, I can do that. Um, it was by a, uh, a, a criminal defense attorney and uh, the leading uh, top racial uh, attorney for the ACLU. And... Um, it, it, it was he gave the lecture uh, two or three years ago and it was called the truth about the Confederacy in the United States and uh, what he's really addresses is the, the history that uh, uh, that Americans have learned and that our history uh, in many cases is false you know we haven't been told the truth about a lot of things um, I don't want to go at length into that it'll probably come up as, as we come on here but uh, he, there was one video clip um, that he did of uh, Cassius Clay 50 years ago before he became Muhammad Ali. He's being interviewed on uh, British television and uh, he's just quipping a little bit about race and, uh, and he's talking about, um, you know, at the end he goes, there, there, there's something wrong, you know, I, I can't, I never realized, but there's really something wrong. And I'm just going to comment some of the remarks he made. He's kidding around. He's kind of joking, but he's dead serious. He goes, you know, Jesus and all the angels are white. Angel food cake is white. Devil's food cake is chocolate. Miss America and Miss Universe are white. The president lives in the White House. There's the goodness of Snow White. There's the White Knight. And, of course, Mr. Clean is really white. And bad things are often black. The Black Death... The hero wears a white cape. The villain is black, except Zorro. Black connotates menace and evil, like Dracula. Black is associated with death and mourning. A black cat is bad luck. If the lights go off, it's a blackout. There's the illicit black market. There was Black Friday on Wall Street. When somebody threatens you, it's blackmail. The ugly duckling in the children's fairy tale, the ugly duckling is black. I just want to bring that up because it it speaks to me a little bit about systemic racism. It's not something it, we learn it in obtuse, abstract ways, and they're subtle and they're unconscious. But I think I think there's something to this, and uh, and it's something I just feel that people really have to be aware of uh, when we're addressing this. We don't realize. Um, our preconceptions, but I think there's a basis for them. Uh, my, my, I guess my comments to everyone's uh, definitions. Uh, I'm sorry, your name again? Alan. 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 Jason. John. And, and John. Uh, I think. I think. The, the common. The common theme in that, which I think everybody's definition had, had some. Um, some crossover in it, you know, with with Alan's Albert. Albert, sorry, Albert with Albert's uh, example again. He talked about from a more from a macro level societal right, like the government being involved in decision making, right? So one one thing about racism is racism racism and systemic or institutional racism specifically, you can't have it without having power. Jason Jason talked about it as well, whereas he he gave the example of prejudice versus what he felt was racist. So. And, and, and the example he was giving, saying that black people can't be racist, what he mean, what, what he means specifically is a black person doesn't have a power within an institution to, in fact, to uh, impede upon somebody's opportunity from getting a job, getting housing, getting any opportunities. So while they may have hate, disgust, or, or any of those things, that doesn't that doesn't just 
that doesn't do justice to the definition of what racism is, which is a system based upon power. Right? And then and then, um, John talking about Muhammad Ali, he spoke, you know, how we see in that example how, how language is important, right? Because language and how we define things in that imagery is how we kind of reinforce certain ideas about whomever it may be, right? You know, or, or, or whatever whatever preconceived notions we may we end up um, uh, developing. It's all it's all a part of the um, systematic or institutional racism. So my, my definition, it, it fits within all those, all the information I was given. What I have down is, it's a little, it's a little short and generic, is just societal institutions engage in practices that favor the dominant group and practices that are biased against the subordinate groups. So that's kind of how we'll, we'll, we'll stand around what institutional racism is and how it presents itself. So going back to just slavery and, and, and how throughout the years from 1860, it being abolished in 1865, and how it's it's uh, present, and the things that have been present that have put people of people of African descent here in the Americas in a, in a, in a uncomfortable decision, or a, um, in a in a tough situation. Right? We can talk back without giving specific dates. Slavery was abolished in 1865. So, in places in Mississippi, which had some of the largest concentration of the enslaved. Right? They were people who tried to take positions in government, right? So slavery is abolished. They try to take positions. One one fellow who the name is, forgive me, is is, is eluding me, uh, got a position in, in um, as as a as a senator or or the mayor of a city. In, and again, in Mississippi, at this time, Mississippi had the largest concentration of African slaves in the United States of America. He, so so when they went to vote and they had the voting right, he got the vote in one position of power. Now, immediately in responding, the Ku Klux Klan in that area started to terrorize his the, the office of mayor of the city. <laughs> he tried to enact the federal, uh, the National Guard to fend them off. The Klan in that area knew that he couldn't use federal powers, federal uh, uh, resources to stop to stop local things like that. So the Klan, who was engaging in the terrorizing, understood the laws that actually backed them to terrorize them. And terrorize the city to get the National Guard out of the city in which they pulled them out and killed them. So I bring that story just just to again highlight and that's 1865 was ended. He became, he ran in 1898 for the position of power. Again, people trying to make, make uh, reconstruction. reconstruction, thank you, trying to make steps towards uh, again bettering themselves, getting a the position of power to enact laws and because of the, the systematic racism that's still, in, that's still present because when slavery ended, you, you got to try to visualize it that that the country was founded and all the laws that were present at the time weren't weren't made an equal footing for people of people of color. So once they abolished slavery, they didn't go through all the laws and say, OK, let's take out every racist law or everything that puts these people at a disadvantage. Let's recorrect those all in those moments as, as someone from a legal background. You, you would know better than me when when laws get amended that they usually come up in cases and they and they review them i don't know you can correct me if i'm wrong how president right yeah so 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 slowly but as time keeps going we go from there to then we get to you know uh has everybody heard of black uh black black wall street tulsa can, can someone can someone who's familiar with it kind of just tell me or tell the group about it they wouldn't mind yeah Black Wall Street in Tulsa. Yeah, they have the Tulsa, Oklahoma, 1921. Yeah. What? 1921? Okay. They had a whole section of North Tulsa that, that was run by uh, people of color. They had movie theaters. Some of them even had airplanes. They had their own banks. Uh, they pretty much they excelled like like uh, there were several other cities that also did the same thing, but the our cousins in Tulsa were kind of jealous, and there was racism, and there was an incident where a white elevator operator, a, a female, I guess she parked the elevator a little above or below where it was supposed to be. So where the black, black, I believe it was a shoe shine guy, stepped on the elevator, he stumbled. And the newspapers 
wrote that he had tried to molest her and tempers flared and, and they, the, the white part of, of town just kind of exploded and they came with their guns to, to the northern, to the black part of, part of Tulsa, Black Wall Street and they had guns and the blacks had guns too and I guess accidentally a gun went off and that, that started this whole whole riot and they burnt Black Wall Street was burnt down, they right? destroyed. People left their homes, they were afraid to go back. Some, was some, bombed. several, bombed. Bomb, yes. Uh, and there were, there were a few other incidences like that too also. So blacks did indeed try to exceed, excel in, in society, but they were always stepped on. Like for instance, there was a, Back in the day, they used to have ice man. When they had ice, uh, they'd bring a cube of ice around, put in what was called an ice box. They didn't have refrigerators then. I remember them myself when I was young. And a black man started his own ice ice company. And people who were sharecroppers or that worked for white people were were told don't don't buy from him or we're going to fire you. So. That destroyed his business. Uh, I'm not a good orator, but I'm a thinker. And there's there's uh, three subjects that I wanted to cover. One was that a lot of times when we talk about racial matters, we, we reflect back on slavery. But slavery was actually just to, to start. After slavery, there came uh, sharecropping and there was Jim Crow, and there was redlining, there was the KKK, there was uh, the syphilis experiment that happened. Tuskegee. Yeah. When actually, after I had served in the military, it was still going on. It, it didn't stop till after that. And, and personally, I've, I've been uh, subjected to uh, being denied housing. I've been subjected to being denied jobs. And that reflects back on why the wealth of, of blacks is one-tenth of what it is to whites. And, oh, the mic? <laughs> I just question. I'm glad you, that was one of my things to do with the CI group. talk about because at that point, you know, HBCUs, yeah. you mentioned housing, education, all those things were supposed to, for our veterans were supposed to be utilized and there was a clear disparity Correct. on who was able to either obtain housing, go to school, you know. Levittown but, was a good example. What, what's, what happened in Levittown? They, they, they weren't allowed to live there. You couldn't allow, even someone covered already, you couldn't even sell your house to a black person. Personally, I called one time when they used to advertise housing in the newspaper. I called one time about an apartment, the nice apartment. And the lady said, oh, oh yeah, come on over says, uh, and look at it. Well, I sounded white because of my background. I've been taught how to speak properly. So I guess she assumed that I was white. When I got there, she said, she said that it had just been rented out, like it was only 10 or 15 minutes that had elapsed. She wouldn't even have time to fill out paperwork. Uh, uh, there were three, oh. What year, that, what year was this? This was uh, late 60s. Uh, another thing is black history, oh, three things, three more things. Uh, Black history doesn't go back so far as slavery. Black history goes all the way back to Africa, where we had civilized, civilized uh, societies. In fact, and you can check this out, you can look up Narmer, N-A-R-M-E-R, -E one of the first Faroos. They still have a stone sculptor of him, and you can see he has what's so-called Negroid foot features. And Kofu, Kofu was uh, 
during the period where they built pyramids. Now pyramids, pyramids are aligned with the stars, so they knew astrology. They also had, didn't know uh, math, the algebra, to, to place those stones, but they don't get credit for it. Uh, the pe people that get credit for it actually went to Africa and learned these uh, science, uh, astrology, mathematics from Africa and brought it back to, say, Greece. Uh, medicine was the same way. Medicine started in Africa also. So our history goes way back there. It doesn't, doesn't just go back to slavery. Another thing, this is hard to, this going to be hard to digest and half, maybe half aren't going to, aren't going to digest what I'm about to say, but there's no such thing as race. That's a man-made myth. If, if you categorize people or try to categorize them, Aborigines you would put into this, this black pocket. Uh, Watusis, tall Africans, you'd put them in the, this uh, black box, call them black. Your mic, your mic, Ron. Oh. Yeah, there you go, you got it. Oh, I get carried away. Yeah, do your thing, Ron, I like and, that And uh, pygmies, they're, they're different. They're all different. Ethiopians, they're all different. Even some, uh, some Native Americans, like my grandfather, he had a lot of Native Americans. He'd be considered black, like pigeon oak. If you research, do a little research, you'll find that uh, race is, is a man-made myth. We're all genetically different. I'm one-third I'm one third white, one-third one Nigerian. Like, all of our makeup is different. I think you know, the last, last thing I want to speak on is the Confederate flag. This has been tossed around the past few days while well, I did my research. The Confederate flag initially, when when the Civil War started, was the bars and stripes. It was three bars, three different colors, and a circle of circle of flags. That was that was the original flag, and then it was made the crisscross that we normally associate with the Confederate flag. It was in, initially it was square, and. That happened back during the Civil War also. And then the third third version was that same square with the crisscross blue lines. That was up in the corner of a white flag that was all white. Then finally there was another version where they, they had the, the square flag up in the corner and then a red bar along the side. They, they uh, the flag with with the with the squares, I mean the triangle up up in the corner, looked too much like a surrender flag. So that's why they put the the red bar on the side. Now, the rectangular square that we call the Confederate flag, that actually came out after the Civil War, and the the person that designed the flag uh, made a statement that. It, it was to support white supremacy, and he also mentioned that, uh, or he stated that blacks were inferior. So that's what it's associated with. There's no if, ands, or buts. The person who designed it said, made that statement. Now, the statutes and the curriculum, they determine what's going to be taught and how it's going to be taught. Now the, now, the truth of the matter is to speak to some of the things you said, uh, Mr. Ron, is that, you know, you have these different things that were done by our ancestors that are deliberately omitted from, from textbooks. Mm -hmm. And the reason that is, it's deliberate because the people who are in the position of power, they want you to have a low self-esteem so they can continue to keep you subjugated. So they have a vested interest and having you think that all you can do is dunk, score a touchdown, and, 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 and these little hiccups in success in terms of African-American accomplishments, just these little bleeps on the radar, then re what it really is, a whole breadth and, and a, a whole, um, you know, a, a plethora of accomplishments 
they don't, I mean, if they teach you that, then you might actually think, you know what, I, I have some potential to do likewise. So by me not te allowing you to learn certain things, I keep you in a certain mindset, just like the, the people who control the media, they have a vested interest in depicting us as wearing baggy pants, not how, knowing how to speak, quote unquote, the king's English, and just presenting, presenting us in a negative light. Because again, when you, when you continue to see that, the old adage is a picture's worth a thousand words. You're gonna think that's all I can ascertain to because that's all I'm presented with. So they, so, so, the, and, and again, like another, another hat that I wear, I'm a minister, you know, I'm a Christian, and, and I'm, a, I'm, I'm a reader, and I know the bulk of the people in the Bible were black, you know, I know what the word Kush means, Kushites means burnt face, that's Ethiopian, that's right in the book, I know where the Tigris, Tigris River is, I know where the Nile River is, it's four rivers that came out of the Garden of Eden, you know, and, one, and one, of them, one of them flew through Egypt, I, I know how to read a map, but again, but when we see the Lord and Savior depicted, we tend to see him as you forestated, we see him depicted in a certain way and, be, and, and to be quite transparent, if he was Puerto Rican, I'm good because it's not about what he looked like, it's about the work of the cross. But my point is, let's depict him. If we're gonna depict him, depict him how he, how he said he looked. Now I read in a different places, he said he had bronze hair, he had, wool, he had, he had skin, skin, bronze hair, woolly skin, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, I, I know what bronze looked like, I, I know how to color. That's not white, you know what I'm saying? It's like, so my thing is, you have education that's being disseminated by the people who are in power and they're disseminating it in a way that best serves their interests. So they have a vested interest in misrepresenting the truth and, and the presenting a truth that makes them look like they're, you know, that, 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 they're, the, they're, that they're the it. That, you know, that, that, you know they're, they're the best thing since sliced white bread. And so anytime you, when you have that going on, the person who's looking at that, they think to be successful, I have to be like them. Because they're the model, they're, they're the prototype. I have to act white, I have to talk white, I have to speak white, because they're the model. Because that's what we're being fed. You know, so at the risk of talking too much, I'm, I'm gonna stop. Please, you want the mic? Um, yeah. Hi, good afternoon. My name is uh, Dr. Patricia Kempton, and I'm a member of the Amistad Committee for the State of New Jersey. And I want to address your issue because Amistad legislation was established. New Jersey was the first state in the union to establish an Amistad Commission. The law states that all schools in New Jersey from K through 12 must include the history of Africans and our place, especially New Jersey being the last state in the North to abolish slavery. So we have a long history here in New Jersey of racism. But um, with um, the coming year, the uh, governor has asked the Amistad Commission, given the um, <clears throat> recent events, to be um, front and forward on um, following through and making sure that the law is being instituted in schools. So we're going to be working with uh, school district superintendents, um, social studies curriculum guide uh, uh, instructors, and um, it's coming from the, the, May, the governor. So, you know, we've been doing this now since 2008, but there has been nobody to really shepherd it through the schools and the state and to ensure that these things are done. I have a few pamphlets I'll pass around. Just I'd like them back, but just to get to look at um, Amistad Summit here that I attended. This was um, the 175th anniversary of the Supreme Court decision as you're a lawyer. It was the first civil rights case in America where the um, they were not slaves, they were captives from Africa were being shipped and um, from, from Cuba and um, they overtook the ship and um, I don't know if you've seen the movie okay well then you know the, the pretty much the story but it, it turned out that John Quincy Adams took the um, case and they brought it all the way to the Supreme Court and they were able to prove that they were not 
born in America, that they were from Africa, that they were slaves, no, excuse me, that they were not slaves, and that they had been abducted. So this is on the Amistad Commission. Could you pass that around? Thank you. And uh, to that end, you talked about um, the black Christian myths in the Bible. Um, this is the Black Madonna from Poland. Um, as part of my studies, I was with the Holocaust Commission of New Jersey. And um, I was picked as a Holocaust scholar. And um, I saw this long line outside a church one day and passed these around. I always come with artifacts. <laughs> it says on the back what it is. But I stood in line and I asked these people, what are you doing, what are you doing? So anyway, they said, we're coming to pray. We make a pilgrimage every year. So little did I know, I walked into this church and there was this big, huge, and beautiful um, sculpture and painting of a black Madonna and baby Jesus. So everywhere I go, I try to find these. Uh, another one is in um, Spain, in Montserrat. Every pope that's ever been a pope has been to this uh, monastery to pray. And at the top of the hill is a black Madonna and a baby Jesus, black. I'll show it to you later. Um, the other thing is the slave trade with America was with the Gullah were the most brought here because they were the most uh, skilled. Okay, and um, so this book will show you they were the most prized, they sold for the most, and mostly out of South Carolina, which is where my ancestry is from. And um, they were known as the Wayward Coast, but they grew rice. And rice became the major crop in America, not cotton. So you need to know that too. And they could pass that around. And um, as a result of that, I have a, here. This is where they were housed, in Bunce Island, in um, Sierra Leone, West Africa. And um, this is now being uh, preserved with the Smithsonian here in America because so many of our um, African ancestors came from here. And um, this was a very sobering day. When I went to the 200th anniversary of the ending of slavery to uh, Sierra Leone with the Amistad Committee, I um, went on a day trip. We went to Bunce Island. So um, it was very sad, but you can see, take a look at that. These are all, that's from the Smithsonian now. And um, these are from two slave plantations in South Carolina. I was trying, I would like to get together um, maybe a tour. You know, we could talk, Mary Ann and others, and um, do a, a, a tour through South Carolina to some of these plantations and out in places where um, where um, the slaves from Bunce Island and Sierra Leone went. Now, on the, on the good side, <laughs> um, in um, the culture, there's always crafts. Um, African people were very talented. This is an example of seagrass uh, basketry, which is um, being continued by the people of South, the women of South Carolina and the children. They're being taught, thank God. But here's a book that's um, row upon row, which describes a lot of the basketry. And these are my personal things, but these are bread plates. And um, Here's an article on the Gullah, Gullah heritage with uh, basketry and um, seagrass baskets. Now, I wanted to show you this one last thing. This is the one from Sierra Leone. 
as you can see, it's the same pattern. So the heritage continues through hundreds of years of how to weave these baskets. Um, and lastly, this is a um, this is a book about slave narratives. If you ever want to, I would recommend everybody read Frederick Douglass's Narrative of a Slave. It's not even 90 pages, but it's um, firsthand and how he managed to escape and become leading abolitionist. But everybody should read that. I used to always read it, have my students read it in um, high school and college classes because nothing substitutes firsthand knowledge. Autobiographies are, to me, very powerful. If you want to learn something and have a class, teach autobiographies, because this is people's words. That's it. <laughs> That's all I got. <laughs> Can I think? Yeah. I, I, yeah, please go ahead. You brought up education, and I spent my life in education, both in research and teaching, and as a principal and as an assistant superintendent, and I'll tell you what, I was kind of horrified when I went downtown. Um, I was constantly admonished for um, talking about the kids. What are you talking about the kids for? You know, the, the bottom line is the budget, or the bottom line is uh, what we're gonna buy next year. Our, our children have always been under-resourced. The only shot we had was uh, when the Abbott decision went through. And we finally had resources. And I, I'm just going to tell you a personal experience. Uh, at the time I was principal of an elementary school, uh, the first thing I did was I told the custodians, I want to throw out every textbook in the school. And they said, whoa. What are the teachers going to use? What are the? I said, don't worry about it. Just throw them out. So when the teachers came in for their pre-opening session, I told them what I had done. And I told them, you're all trained teachers. You all know history. But we're going to do things a little different in this school. So we started creating our own curriculum. And because we created our own curriculum, our children were no longer reading the lies my teacher told me. They were reading things like uh, a translated Spanish first mate's log book from the passing, okay? Uh, I had a, a fifth grader say to me, hey, Miss Klaus, I said, what's up, Joey? And he said, I want to change the name of this unit. And I said, well, you're calling it exploration right he said nah he said i want to i want to call it with exploration comes exploitation so we changed the name of the unit you know i mean fifth grade he he got that he understood that um and then another time our kids were well on that school passed the state tests we surpassed grade levels percentages across the state and it was because the children were taught to think. Not, not to what to think, but how to think. And then at a, a middle school, our kids were doing exceptionally well. And uh, we had made all the little check boxes that the state had for us. And then I got a letter from the state saying that they were changing the scoring system. So now, Klaus, your kids didn't do so well. Okay, so that's a prime example in my mind of systemic racism. Okay, the black kids, the Hispanic kids started doing too well. So what did they do? They changed the scoring system. So I, I've seen it myself. Um, I've felt it. I, I, I've hurt for my staff because they work so damn hard to make it different. 
Thank you. Speak loud. Speak loud. Um, anyway, um, it's not working, so. Is it? Close it to your mouth. I, I put it up there. I, Come on, Mary Ann. You can do it. You can swallow it. You can do it. Hey, hey. Anyway, um, I think everybody can hear me. Can you hear me over there? Thank you. So, I, I'm not asking for favors for children. I'm just asking for opportunity. And that's what's lacking across our nation. That opportunity. I, I don't know how any of the rest of you feel, but I'm sure you've got stories about lack of opportunity in your own lives. Would anyone care to to share a story about that lack of opportunity? No? Where were you a teacher? What? Where were you a teacher? Trenton. Trenton. Um. I got one example I'll tell you right away. And that was when I was in high school. The guidance counselor told me I shouldn't go to college. <laughs> Uh, I should stay in the business classes. I was told as a senior, <clears throat> I was told as a senior in high school not to go to college. That I, I, I wouldn't do well and I wasn't cut out for college. And um, there was a program that came along. There was a, pro it's not working. One, two, check it, one, two. Oh, check one, it. One, two. Let's use our inner voice, the deep one. I don't have one like you. Anyway, <laughs> a program came along called um, Upward Bound. Yes. Yes. And um, Upward Rock Bound. Wait, Upward Bound. Upward Bound uh, took um, students, um, African American, Hispanic, and some Asians who scored decently on tests nationally. And um, they put us in programs. Some of us went to Yale, some of us went to MIT, some of us went to Wellesley, some of us went to Tufts. And we spent six weeks as a summer on campuses. And out of that, I got a scholarship to college. And um, from I went to Tufts University, I had my Bachelor of Arts. I went to Boston College, I got my Master's in Philosophy. And then I went to UMass Amherst and I got my PhD. So for someone who was told that you couldn't go to college and wasn't smart enough, I think I proved them wrong. wrong. <laughs> so I wanted to say that. I think I can invoke Mrs. Harrison, Harrison's name because I'm sure she's no longer with us. Also, Shel can you hear me? And, and, uh, Excuse me, we're experiencing slight difficulty because we have a short cord. Uh, what I'm trying to do is bring the mics closer so when we speak, can we just get up and speak at the mic so we can talk to each one facing everyone? Okay. Thank you. That mic's better though. When I was in high school, the guidance counselor told me. When I was picking out my courses, I said I wanted to take Spanish because I felt like Spanish was the language that, uh, well, might be required if I wanted to go to higher education. Well, the guidance counselor told me, oh, no, I don't think you, you're not smart enough to take Spanish. But when I went to college, I took Spanish one and two, and I did very well. And even after, after college, I did good in it. Second incident was when I was in eighth grade. I was kind of, I got good grade matter. I, I got the, I got the brain power, but I have no ambition. So in eighth grade, Mr. Well, I won't use his name. Eighth grade, the teacher told me, I remember sitting on the south side of the classroom and him sitting right, right next to me and telling me, uh, the only reason why we're not going to keep you back in eighth grade is because we don't have a room to accommodate you. And then his exact words were, you're never going to amount to anything. The teacher told me that. 
Well, that inspired me because I got the ability. I just didn't have the ambition. That inspired me to uh, make the honor roll the first semester when I was in uh, freshman in high school. And when the teacher came and told me, Mrs. O'Connell, when she came and told me, oh, you made the honor roll, and I, I related to her what my eighth grade teacher had said. And I said, I hope you get this back to him. That uh, maybe it wasn't me, maybe it was his efforts. I later went online and, and uh, tried to find some information on this teacher. And I found that uh, he had been trained at Trent State College. He was in the Navy. And after he had left, left our school system, it seems like he helped uh, disadvantaged children and he became pretty proficient at it. So I always like to think that maybe, maybe that he, he gave up on me and then saw that I made the honor roll the next year, maybe that changed his thinking. Maybe he thought maybe it's not the child, maybe it's who's teaching. So I always carried a resentment till I saw that and I, I said a prayer and I forgave him for it. Can I, can I speak? Right here, behind you. We're touching on areas of racism in school and one actually catapulted me to where I am at right now. And I didn't know it was racism or just plain stupidity by one of my English teachers. Her name was Miss Tile. And uh, I grew up in Newark, I'm from Newark. Um, the last time I graduated in a ceremony was fourth grade. In the, I, you know, you go to some and you move on. Fourth grade, actually eighth grade, was the last time I graduated in a ceremony. The ceremony never really bothered me. I really didn't care, I just wanted to go to the next level. Partying and all that didn't bother. But this is, this is I just didn't understand this part of the racism stupidity that my English teacher gave me. I go to school, I play basketball, never intended to, always wanted to play a saxophone, and I got kicked into playing basketball because I'm the tallest guy in the school and you're in the band. <laughs> Didn't love basketball until this day, you wouldn't believe. I don't love it as much as people think I do. It took me a lot of places. I saw a lot of things, I got paid well, and excelled in it. Never really had a love for the game. So my English teacher failed me. <laughs> she failed me because um, she knew what I wanted. College scouts coming to the school, I'm number three in the nation. All I had to do is pass her class. Uh -oh. My ticket is written. Plane is already gassed up. She failed me. Oh. Here it is, never gonna be in this ceremony at the end of the school year. Gotta go to summer school to get another diploma. Not only that, all Division I colleges, number three in the nation, all Division I colleges, he's out of there. Mm. Now I gotta fight to get to a Division Three. So my question was, I did what I had to do to get to where I needed to be. I, w I wanted to know why, why didn't you just pass me? So before the end of the school year, I went to Princeton and they had this program called Princeton Review. I joined the program, went over to Hunter College in New York, did what I had to do there. All I had to do was pass the test for uh, the theses. What's that test? SAT? The, no. The test you have to give in at the end of high school, you have to write a paper, yeah. term paper. I got help, they showed me how to do it, we did it, give it to us, she still felt me. Miss mm. Tao, why did you fail me? Because all you are is a basketball player, a sportsman, and that's the only reason you're going to the next level so they could use you. That, that, that was my whole point. I didn't care. I just wanted to get out of here to get there to get to the next level. So you held me back because they were gonna use me? I know they're gonna use me. I don't got no money to go to college. I'm getting a free ride and you fail me? So I wonder for years, years, what was it that made you stop a brother, a black man, a student of yours from getting to where you didn't want me to be. 
she was teaching up at Montclair State University now, but it was my state, Montclair State College then. And she didn't like the fact that one of the schools that was recruiting me turned her son down Whoa. to take me. Her son was 6'10", I was 6'8". He had better grades, but I, have, I was number three in the nation. Who's gonna turn that down? So I'm looking at the, the I don't know if we call it stupidity. Neither one of us got where we wanted to go. So I asked, is, is that racism? So what was your reason? That was your reason, but that was our only way out. None of us had the money. That was the only way out. So I'm going back farther into her. What made you resent another black person that you had as a student, besides them recruiting your son, that would make you want to knock both of us out? Because she was knocked out <laughs> uh. earlier in her career as becoming a teacher. Yes, she is. That's that's so. Is, is I'm I'm trying to go farther even back there, like because the system, as you was just saying, they have they have African American literature for our schools, but we have no one to put it in there to implement it to the students. I don't know how it works, but where have you gone to push this? We need people that can push this curriculum into our students. Now the systematic, you got the people up top not letting this curriculum go through to educate the kids of their history. Systematic. From up top, people in power inflicting ignorance upon those beneath them. Because you say the best person to hurt you is an educated person. Someone just said the Klan knew that the, they couldn't bring the National Guard in. Educated. Got them out, terrorized the black people. Educated. Educate someone, best thing to do, don't educate them. Systematic, that's up top. So I, I don't know you men here, and I heard some of your conversations earlier. Golf. I don't play, but I know how to caddy. <laughs> a lot of business is done on a golf course. So, you guys probably know this place called Minersing. And if you don't, look it up. It's in Ryan, New York. I live at Five Halls Lane in Ryan, New York. I can walk from my house to Minersing, but I can't get a membership there. Ryan, New York. Can't get a membership there. So I speak to this guy, I say, hey man, help me get a membership here. No, can't. The question I ask you guys to play golf today, take a black man, and he's just gonna caddy for you for the day on your, he's just gonna do a half session, not 19 holes, he's gonna do nine holes. Would you take him with you? I've never used a caddy in my life. <laughs> but, but even I if- was one. <laughs> I, I caddy out in Arizona where there's no shade. So, <laughs> but that's the question I ask you. So, you, you, we have, at some point, part in our life, the opportunity to break the, the systematic things, even if it's a small part, put a crack in it. The guy that I asked to get me into my nursing, he said, you're not going to get into my nursing. The only black thing that's there is the tarmac. <laughs> but he did something better. He put me in a position to make the money he makes. You know, Wall Street, you put me there. Look, I'm gonna send you to get your Series 7, you're gonna get Blue Sky. Once you get Blue Sky, I run, he runs a hedge fund, I'm gonna bring you to the hedge fund, and then right there, you're flying on your own. I would've never gotten that opportunity if someone of ca Caucasian color would've never taken the time to break the crack to put somebody in to change their life. So, we say Black Wall Street, we still have opportunity to get another Black Wall Street. I'm still in on it. I'm trying to bring other people in from something somebody else did to break that one crack, that one little crack of systematic racism. He understood it, we live it. I live in the same neighborhood as you, but I can't go to the doggone same beach club as you because I'm black. But you see this and you say, hey, let me take this guy and give him another opportunity. Do you think you can do that or do you think you have opportunities where you can do that? I mean, I'm not, 
Yeah, of course. So how do we break these racial habits? Just that little crack. One crack at a time, one person at a time, and it builds up. Yes, go ahead, go ahead. Take the mic. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Mod Field. I'm oh. the host with Mary Ann Klaus. Just a couple words. Uh, I listened um, to what, what Mitch uh, stated. Um, this is about information, seeing things um, the same or seeing things very differently. And listening to Mitch, um, I was a student athlete um, out of Passaic High School, went to Montclair State, Fairleigh Dickinson Masters, and now pursuing my doctoral degree at Seton Hall University. Now, I want to comment on what the doctor mentioned earlier. I'm one of the liaisons for the Amistad legislation in Patterson, New Jersey School District. There's something that's called CUSAC. And CUSAC has to check to see if everyone is in the state is infusing African American history, not black history, dealing with the di African diaspora. That's number one. So we need to cover that and make sure that that's infused from K to 12. Dr. Harris, who's a part, who runs the executive director, who runs that, is really doing that with a very limited uh, skeleton crew helping her infuse that in the state. The things won't change from an educational perspective until we are inspecting what we expect and have the personnel to do it. Yeah. So if we don't have the personnel to infuse it, in addition to QSAC catch, checking all the areas in the state of New Jersey, making sure this history is being taught, then we are all not being educated that way. It's not good enough to sit there and teach it in the class. So that's not the way the legislation is supposed to be infused. It's supposed to be infused K to 12, that's the first thing. The second thing, while I heard where Mitch, where Mitch was coming from, I'm coming from a very different lens. I played Division Three. I believe that what that teacher may have been doing through my humble experiences is saying, hey young man, I'm not giving you a free pass because I'm gonna hold you accountable to a standard that is equivalent to where everybody else is reaching for and just because you're a student athlete, we're not gonna give you the free ride. She may have been looking at it from that perspective, I don't know, but as an educator, I think there should have been a further conversation with her or with the principal or with administration to see what is it that you need or with something that you didn't get to differentiate that instruction to make sure that she wasn't just giving you a pass and giving you a grade because that's not how life works. So a different, as I heard that, I had to sit there and think about my own expectations, right? Being a Division three athlete where at the end of the day, you get a handshake. You don't get any bonuses, it's about academics, then athletics. So it all depends on expectation and how we're gonna view that. Now I think teachers need to be aware of the expectations and what can happen with student athletes and give the support that's necessary and that passion to learn and to excel needs to be infused in the young people with support from the very beginning. I'll, I'll ride two hours to Mary Ann's house or to John's house in Hopewell to work on my writing, to work on my information, to grow. So in order to do that and our kids to do that, we must understand as the change agent in this business to infuse that passion with support so, so people will want to go and do that. The children will want to go fight that fight and feel that it's worth it. Because if we don't do that, and we don't come together like we're doing now to, to address the conversation, if you ask yourself, there's a grocery store behind you and that's the tree. The tree is the grocery store. And all I have to do in an urban setting that's struggling is watch the store and make sure the police don't come 
for 30 seconds and you may get a hundred dollars because there's some kind of drug or narcotic being sold. Now, the child is saying, I have to eat. I'm in this poverty stricken position. This, this is my choice. So it's real conversations and our job is to make sure that the social economical piece, that the young people can compete to not make that decision. Otherwise, we're in a sad predicament. So I just wanted to just frame that. Yes. Part of the workout, just part of the health plan. Good. <laughs> Jog in place. I walk, I walk on cobblestones all over San Miguel de Ande, so this is easy. Um, what you brought up there at the end about watching the candy store and kids going to pick up a hundred bucks to make sure a cop doesn't show up and everything. The subject comes up, you know, we're, we're, I understood we were coming here to talk about racism, systematic racism, and what, you know, and racism is usually figured, right? It's usually white on black. We're racist. There's a lot comes up in the white community occasionally when Chicago comes up, the most crime infested place in the country probably. And I did a little reading on Chicago um, because it's a question in my mind too. People can't quite figure out how come, you know, why is it as bad there as it is? And of course it's, you know, predominantly black community and Hispanic and it's been going on for a long time. And Why can't it be policed? And uh, I'm by no means an expert on this at all. I just started reading up on it because it's always been something curious to me. Um, and I started reading about the gangs. The gangs in the Chicago, that's responsible for 90% of the killings, robberies, school children being killed. Um, it's just, the more I read about it, uh, the environment there, I, I cannot, uh, you know, I just can't possibly imagine what that is like. Um, and. I remember them saying that, you know, there's just, economically, um, there's no way out. It's very, very hard to get out of that. Um, and I just, I would like maybe some of the black people here to, to maybe address that. Uh, uh, what, 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 what that ghetto is like and, and why, because white people point to it sometimes and go, well, what about that? You know, why can't you solve that problem? And th I know that there's a million reasons that that problem is extremely difficult to solve. So I hope you understand where I'm coming from. Yes, yes. Okay. I think there's a youngest person here other than Damon. My name is Arshin. I grew up uh, under Ahmad. Jason and their brother, God bless the dead Reg, who was like, in the projects of the sake, they were our first positive role models. Ahmad, Reggie, they were in, like I tell Ahmad, they don't even realize it or know it, but they were our first role models to say, you don't have to sell drugs. You can go to college. Look, I did it. My brother did it, their sister did it. They all went and they were nowhere near the richest people in the projects, right? So I just think of race a little different. I, I've never really encountered much racism, right? Maybe because of my complexion and people don't know what I am. They don't know if I'm black or if I'm white or if I'm Hispanic. I've never encountered it. But what I think is, I don't think you'll ever be able to change a racist person from being racist. I don't think you'll ever change that. <clears throat> what I think we have to do is educate, like you guys are saying, the youth about it, right? And a lot and a lot of people here kept talking about slavery and way back, because I know that's where it started, but let's try to move forward because we can't change that. It's happened already. We can't change it how do we make it better? 
How but do we our make it youth. Better? How do we make it better? Right? But go ahead, Damo. Yeah, you gotta go. No, keep on. Okay, so with that, right, I believe it's education. And when I say education, I'm not talking about the history books. It's about financial education, the things they don't teach us in school. So I believe everything starts at home because what I teach my three kids is what's important to them versus what they may hear from a teacher, right? So not many school teachers teach racism, but we still have racist people. Where is it taught at? Where was the racism being taught, oh. right? And so with us and what I've noticed, most black people that grow up in poverty stricken areas, we are raised to, let's say, we are raised to like survive. survive, but also we want things that have no value. We put value on things that have no value. Cars, jewelry, right, materialistic things. We don't value education. Not many black people value education. That's not what's really being taught at home the by the masses, so right? And that's just what, that's how I feel. No, get it, get it, no, get it, please. So I believe at home we're being taught you gotta go to work, you gotta make money. That's not necessarily educating because most people are going to work saying, I have to make this dollar. Not let me go to McDonald's and learn how to run a McDonald's and eventually buy one. Yeah, so so well, I'm going to go, um, Jason, next thing you'll be up. And remember, everybody, everyone's speaking their opinions, too. Yes. Right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Yes. There's, right. there's, yeah. no, there's, no, there's no absolute, we're all figuring out um, how, we, how we see this perspective. The reason we started with the history, just so you understand, to your point to the question, if you follow it, it kind of helps, helps answer the question. Uh, Chicago, just briefly, I'm going to give you something, Jason. Chicago is also one of the most segregated places in America, and a lot of that's done financially. So the areas that you're referring to that are gang infested are also the poorest areas in the city, which if you look at the industrial age when jobs changed and people couldn't you know, move forward with employment, they were, they were pushed towards certain options, which is some, somewhat of what Arshin is talking about as well in the, in the poverty of the sake. So generally when you, we talked about, we talked about, uh, Race, uh, race not being a thing, right? But in America, we've socially constructed and put power behind it, so it's something we still have to recognize. Yes, it's a man-made, it is man-made, it is socially constructed, but once power, um, education, housing, the things that are, that are essential to, to uh, the, uh, being successful in America, once those things were accompanied by it, it became a reality that people were, people were ranked. There was a hierarchy because of it now. Uncle Jason, you have to Could I just say Thank one you. thing about that? Yeah. Chicago, yeah. when I was coming up, I spent summers in Chicago with my cousins. I'm talking about 60 years ago. There were gangs called the Razorettes. There was gang. Chicago has always had gangs, so let's not let's not put that on the table. But they also had generation after generation of systemic poverty. And you can't you can't move with somebody's got their foot on your neck. We've seen it, it's just happened with George Floyd. It keeps happening again and again and again. We're over-militarized, we're undereducated, we don't get, you know, you can't get the job you want. They take the transportation out. There's a food desert, you can't even get decent food. Half the people have diabetes and high blood pressure. The health system sucks. You see that now with all these people dying with the pandemic? Who's it affecting? People in brown, people but black and brown people. So let's not get over uh, over over hyped here yeah. about why this gang so bad in Chicago. Look at the systemic that systemic racism right there. Yeah. That's all I gotta yeah. say. Yeah. I've been waiting for a minute. Yep. I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Please, 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 please. Please. Just putting that out there. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just, no, no. The Lord bless you. No, I appreciate the insight, but I'm, I just didn't want to get, get get cut. But you know, a lot of things were said before I said anything. So I'm, I'm, I may be a minute now, Mitch. In, in, in my humble opinion, what I think happened to you, I think you were the recipient of someone's displaced anger. That's, I don't think that was racism. I think the, the, the sister had some bitterness regarding her own experience and regarding what was happening with her son because she was angry about what happened to her. You just happened to be the scapegoat. But I don't, I don't, I don't constitute that as racism. I constitute that as displaced anger. 
she was angry and she had uh, the opportunity to demonstrate that anger to you because of what was going on with you but I don't look at that as a, a as, as a racist gesture or a racist experience personally what you said now in terms of the economic piece the economic piece is somewhat duplicitous and what I mean by that is it's you know, it's interesting because I hear people say sometimes oh there's there's not money in the black community oh no that's a lie oh there is money in the black community the problem is that black people don't tend to be the recipients because if there wasn't black people money in the black community, why would these other people be opening up their establishments there? Why would the Chinese restaurant be there? Why would the pizza restaurant be there? Why would these different places be there if it wasn't lucrative? No, it's lucrative, but what happens is sometimes we just don't we don't we don't benefit from it. We don't we don't benefit from our own community. Ironically enough, we live there, but we go there and get a slice of pizza, we go there and get wings and you know, wings and fried rice and mugu guy pan and stuff. They're right there in the hood. So there is money in the hood. But sometimes there is a lack of African American owned establishments. And so African American ownership, you know, so that's sometimes where the issue is. And the truth of the matter is, it's like, in terms of our white brethren, you know, sometimes they, they, they ask the question, what can we do to help? I have the perfect solution for that. I'm glad I'm here. When you are in your respective environments in the job, when you're having that water cooler talk and there's no brothers and sisters there, and when you have the opportunity to speak to equality, to speak to the inequities, do so. When you see somebody getting ready to get a position based on nepotism, when you know somebody else should have that position, what, how do you respond? That's what you can do. When you are in your respective sphere of influence, what do you do to empower or to promote equity, to promote equality? Because there are places where you are where we are not. If the NFL owners had an, a meeting right now, right, if they had a meeting right now, you know right, what would happen? You would see a lot of white people. And you might see one black person. You know why? Because they're the owners. And you know why Colin Kaepernick has been out of football? because he took a stance that at the time it was controversial. It's the same thing with Cassius Clay. He said, I'm not going, he said the Viet Cong never called me nigga. Why am I going to fight for you? And you know what they did? They straight stripped his belt. Why? Not because he did something that was amoral or unethical, but he took a moral position that was uncomfortable and it was not pleasing to those who were in power. So you know what they did? They disempowered him and they took his belt. And what did they do to Colin Kaepernick? They took it, they, they said, you know what? He's not gonna play. Now people can say whatever they want. You know what? I'm, I'm a football guy. I've been a Cowboy fan since about 76. I know the game. There's no way on this planet you can tell me that he wasn't even better than a third string quarterback? I'm not even saying he had to start. You tell him he couldn't make the squad as a, yeah, you gotta give me some leeway because I was waiting. You, you tell him he couldn't make the squad as a, let's not even, let's not even go to starter route. You tell me this man who starred in the, in, in, in the Super Bowl, he couldn't make it as a, as a third stringer on a roster? Don't insult my intelligence. No, I got a master's. No, he was kept out because he maintained a position that was unpopular and, 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 and that had negative repercussions and ramifications to them to those who were in power and they and, and they disenfranchised him and it's and it's the same thing they did with that brother who arguably had the sweetest shot in the history of college basketball and the pros Mahmoud Abdul Raouf when that brother decided I'm gonna change my name I'm not gonna salute the flag had no criminal record had no, nothing wrong with him upstanding upstanding citizen you never heard about him doing anything that but when he made that decision they showed him they, they showed him, oh, you want to take this stance? This is what we're going to do. We're going to let you go. You're the, leading, you're the leading scorer, the leading steals, you're leading in assists, but we're going to let you go. So what I'm, say, what I'm saying, different things. But one of the things I'm saying is <clears throat> to, to our, our white brethren, when you are in your respective positions and we are not represented, what are you doing to empower or to promote opportunities so that the level, so the playing field can be level? Because unless you do that, you're going to continue to have a trap. Because the truth is, we're not everywhere. There's a, there's a saying, the spook who sat by the door. You know why the spook sat by the door? Because he can't get in. That's why he sat by the door. So as long as you are in your inner circles and you act like it's not an issue and you act like 
this is okay, it's the status quo, that's what it's gonna be. This guy, Vic Fangio, he's a coach, NFL coach. You know what he said? There is no such thing as racism. This is Vic Fangio, he's not a young guy, he's not like 18, 20, no, he's probably like 60 plus. Yeah, look it up, look what he said. This is not somebody who's a novice, somebody who's like fresh out of high school. This is somebody who's arguably 65. He said, yeah, look it up, Google it when you get a chance, YouTube it. He said there is no racism. This is the NFL head coach. So this is what I'm so what I'm saying is, you know, again, if you want to help, first of all, you are to be commended. Second of all, second of all, when you have an opportunity to speak to the inequities, act accordingly. Because if you don't, we're gonna continue to have these kinds of things. Now, and that's not that we won't even have them still, but they'll, they'll be lessened. Mm. Can I just Raw emotion come out with Jason. You all being too nice here, uh, and I know we're supposed to be nice. Uh, don't get me wrong. Yeah. Ah, but, but, but that's the first time. Yeah, okay. That's the first time that I, I saw the raw emotion. But I want to say this. You hit the nail on the head for me. What's your name? Arshi. Never heard that name before. I'm Albert. You know, it's kind of common, Albert. Well, Arshi, you really hit the nail on the head. Um, I want to say four things. I'm one of the guys that my friend here has been talking about that thinks about Chicago every day. I go look at the murder record. I go see this. And I, I shake my head in, in shame and say, why isn't something being done? And I keep saying that over and over again. You don't live there so you can take care of your kids and teach. I cannot conceive of what it's like to be a child growing up in Chicago, the South Side. It's got to be horrendous. I would be like you on caffeine. I'd be way above you if I was there. But having said that, I also try to look at other commentators, other than those such as yourselves, that look at the past as you see it. And I'm going to throw some names out there that I read from time to time. And I mentioned him to John. He knows him. Larry Elder. Is he a nut? Yes. OK. Candace Owens. Is she a nut? Yes. He grew into it. Yeah. Thomas Sowell, professor at, was he at Stanford? Is he a nut? No, he's not a nut. And then how about Heather McDonald, who wrote about the war on cops? Now, having said that, the reason I admire what you said most of all, we can sit here and argue about how bad it is or how good it is. You may have convinced me racism is not just, hey, you're a blackie and I'm a whitey. It's, not, it's the power part. Okay, I had never thought of it that way, so I can accept that. Okay, but the reason the real thing to say is, with all you calm people, what do we do now to achieve it? And you gave some answers. Yeah. Well, your talk about education to me was right on point. I listened to Channel 4, that's the Peacock station, I think. Yeah, that's good. They had Charles Barkley and a bunch of other people on. He said there's different classes of people. There's whites, there's black, and then there's us. They had all these great athletes there. And they said, we're treated pretty good. Yeah. We're treated great. We're, we're uh, like Charles Barkley. <laughs> I'd kiss his hand. They went back to the, the 1950s, okay? They go back to the 50s and 60s when John and Marianne and I were in high school. Every singer of import was black, practically. Nat King Cole, the Shirelles. I could go on and on with the names of these groups. Somehow we were having this racist thing going on, but we worship these people and for some reason wanted to be with them. So my point to you, sir, is that you're right. Thinking of, rather than putting blame, because I think blame yeah. serves no purpose. It's there, it exists. I, and all these things are great. I, I really appreciate hearing what you had to say. But what do we do now to correct this? And the education bit's important. What Charles Barkley said is, in the ghetto that he came from, and again, Mary, in the book you said you can't use ghetto. You have to call it inner city because it's a euphemism. Ghetto, ghetto is a bad thing to say, but euphemism, uh, the euphemism of inner city is good. He said that if you were tall and could put the ball in the hoop, you had a much better chance of getting out of the ghetto or inner city than if you weren't. Can you imagine, like you know, six eights, whatever you are, tall nine. What, can you imagine, however, if, like, take John. 
he was, and I can speak about John because he's one of my heroes in high school. John, you were a baseball player. I know you went to Seton Hall. I know you're all American. You're all these things, and you want to play with the Yankees. To me, that's fantastic. But you were given opportunities to think about, it, whether it was college or whatever it was. So one thing I say is you have to give kids the education, not just the book learning, but the like you exactly what you're saying. Now, my bone that I tossed to, uh, to the black community was to educate six of them in, in community college and pay for their college. This was like 10 years ago, okay? But have, what have I done since? Nothing. Uh, so my point is, I think that we've got to come up with solutions for this. And I'm also concerned about this, because this started, Marianne and I, on this months and months and months and months ago. I'm sorry, I do not see systemic racism in the police department. I see racism, I see bad cops, but I prosecuted for 25 years, I've dealt with cops, I know cops, they're not, they may be racist at times, I guess, I don't, I don't think they're out to get black. And if they are, I've never seen it, I know you're gonna differ with me, but I, I have, the ones that I represented in Hunterton County, which is kind of a, you know, different situation. Yeah. So, so I, it's, it's different. So, yeah, so I can't speak to what you see at all, but I would suggest to you that you think a second. Are the police racist, particularly when the chief in Baltimore, the two, the second and third in command, first and second in command after the chief, the mayor, everybody's black. What the hell happened here? Why is we got that fella killed in ba in Baltimore some years ago? So I wanted to talk about that, and I'll give you the microphone. No, no, you're going too no, much. No, no, just listen. No, no, just listen. No, I went too much. No, no, you're going just fine. Yeah. Just yeah. fine. Yeah. Hold on. Just I want to hear from him. Hold on. Hold on. We, my, my man right here, yeah. And then, and then Zot, and then Jason. That's the one. <laughs> I don't have a speech. I, I have a question. Yeah. Um, when they had the news reports of uh, the recent riding, uh, they mentioned the 1921 Tulsa riots. Yeah. So I had never heard of them, which speaks to your point about history not being told. Uh, they had over 300, okay, independent black businesses. They were lawyers. That, that, that system in that section of Tulsa was a thriving economic community. What I want to know is, why isn't that a model? What, why isn't that to look, be looked at? Why, isn't that something that ought to be at least looked at to see what they did? I mean, I know it was destroyed by the, the uh, rioting, but they were doing something right there. Um, you mentioned that you had the... You, you, you so let, me just, let me just answer that real quick. Just give you a, a, a comment. We have, to, we have to change policy. See, we're not talking about... We're, we're mentioning things, but in order to have change that can, that can be measured for a period of time, it's attacking policy so we can model that, John. There's something called five versus four. Local government and board of education and the voting process and how the process is, 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 is given to us, we stop our own change sometimes based upon the political framework. So we got to go through the system and, if, and you ask, what can we do? If our white brethren that are like-minded and open don't have to agree with everything, but if we go together to address policy based upon how we see things, that is a start with lobbyists and policy to change. So John, if Marianne proposes a model for a school, charter school, or for curriculum in any urban district, is it gonna be heard? Because it was successful based upon what you said, it makes common sense what you said. I totally agree with you. But we have to get the system together so we can receive that with curriculum instruction and other things. All right, let me just uh, respond to that. There, I, I was curious about that Tulsa rioting. And uh, I was trying to find something that might have been similar to that 
what I was asking for is a group that may have got, come, uh, let's say, into the inner city or whatever the euphemism is, and succeeded. Um, so in 1975, the Vietnamese came to this country, and they came in two waves, the ones that helped us and then the boat people. They couldn't speak the language. They weren't white. They were yellow and brown. They lived in what we called the inner city. And today, their average income is higher than the average American income. And it's also higher than any native-born American, excuse me, foreign-born immigrant. They, if you can look it up, they, they earn on average $65,000 a year. So there's a model. What did they do? Why wouldn't they be worth looking at? Anybody? Can I, yeah, I got it. Real, real quick. Yeah. Uh, Did you have a response to that, Zatidi? Yeah. You sure? I'll address another thing. Okay. Quickly, this is a parallel situation. I, I dated somebody years ago that, that played golf, so I went and caddied for her. And it was uh, an all-black uh, golf course. Okay. That's similar to, similar to Tulsa. Black like Wall Street will, will make them the same. Okay, with well, things, the reason they had this black golf course is because they weren't allowed to play anywhere else. You know, there were exceptions, but generally they couldn't play elsewhere. So, what happened was the situation changed where blacks could play, they were accepted, they could play anywhere they want to. And my, my brother-in-law plays golf, and I questioned him about this. I said, why is, uh, why is this place that I carried at, why is it not doing good anymore? He said, it's because the business that used to be, be all there, consolidated, now it's spread all around. So that, that golf course, so that's like a parallel situation. In Tulsa, there was uh, it dealt, they, Black Wall Street was successful because they were discriminated from elsewhere. So that's so you're talking about concentrated power. Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah. Right. Come, yeah, come up here, please. And then yeah, if anybody's hungry, the, the food is out. Yeah, I'm, to... that's a bad seat. The sun's in your eyes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going over. The... Excuse me, honey. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Zatiri Moody. Um, I heard a lot of comments that I just would like to speak on and have us kind of understand uh, and look at this from a, a, a much different perspective. We talked about Tulsa, Oklahoma, and uh, how that town was ravished, uh, burned down to the ground. Folks were murdered. We talk about Chicago. What happened there? Why are we not asking, why is so much violence in that area? over a whistle or a tripping over a, 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 a elevator. You kill people, you take their business, you take everything they own and you kill them. You wonder at, as to how African-Americans or people of color respond so uh, uh, violently in Chicago. Let's look at their situation. Let's talk about as a people. If you never knew your parents, if, 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 if millions of black men have been uh, locked up just because we wanted to keep the prison force going uh, after slavery, so we lock people up because you tried to vote, let's lock you up. So if you don't have a father to teach you those values at home and you don't have parents to teach you those values at home, you're being raised by a system, a racist system that doesn't even take you into account. What type of person do you think is, is, is coming out of that? So we talk about these inner cities. I work in an alternative school, and I work, uh, my father's here. He, he started a program working with adjudicated youth, young people who committed crimes and were incarcerated, facing two to three years of prison at 13, 14 years old. So he had to, we, 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 we had to get that segment of the community. My father was the community father. All my friends did not know their father. How can we even talk about what's right and what's wrong when kids at 12 years old are making all the rules? I go in homes at 12 years old, kid sleeps with a gun, he makes the rules. He's the father of the house at 12. Do we expect him to make the right decision? 
Then he turned 16, 17, school kicked him out. He's kicked out of school. He's not well educated. What do we expect that young person is to do? I worked at a high school. We fudged numbers for years. We said our graduation rate was 60, 70, 80%, 80%, big, big, big news. The state, if you're not graduating at 95%, you're failing. 50%, and I'm talking about a school of 2,500 kids. So each year you have a freshman class, maybe six, 700. So each year you're losing 300 to 400 kids in a community, a small community. Patterson, New Jersey has five square miles, 160,000 people within five square miles, all fighting to live and survive. We're talking about education. That's the last thing on their mind. Surviving, surviving, and killing their brother next to them is not, it happens without a question, without a thought. If to them or you, and that's the mentality they're living with. So you talk about a Chicago where they were tra raised in gangs and gangs permeated their whole community. These people are, these, there are people, they're, they've been raised. You live in, uh, the, the gentleman, or she said, he looked up to Ahmad, and not that Ahmad is a bad guy. We're all great guys. But I look around and say, if it was not for athletics, you wouldn't even be speaking to us today. I would not be a high school principal. My father told me, and it's crazy, <laughs> coming out of high school, I said, Dad, I want a car. I, I, uh, I'm, I'm an honor society. I'm number seven in my class, 3.9 grade point average. I think I deserve a car. Dad, what's going on? I can't afford a car. I said, you can't afford a car? You didn't put money away from my college fund? If I didn't get a scholarship, how would I get to college? He said, you would have been working at McDonald's. McDonald's? That was my future? So is it, it, I want the same things you guys want. I came here immediately. I said, Marianne, this is a beautiful property. I love this. How many acres is this? We want this too. How do we get it? 3.9 grade point average. Number seven in my class. And this was my college roommate. We went to the University of Pittsburgh. We played football at Pittsburgh. And yes, we played, we, we got a chance to travel around the world with Hawaii. We played with Curtis Martin on our team. I mean, we played with some all pro, some really good guys. You'll love them. They're some of the favorites. Curtis Martin is one of the favorite NFL players of all time. We sat in the same locker room with him. But we would, I would have never got that experience. I asked him, if you did not get a football scholarship, what schools would you have gone to? Me, with a 3.9 grade point average, I would not have gotten into Pittsburgh or Syracuse or any school. I had every school in the Big East coming for me. UCLA, my father could attest to it because I played football. But what about this? Because I went to Eastside High School, for any of you who are not familiar, they made the movie Lean On Me. That's my high school. I said, we're good. Every every kid has a computer, one to one. We just keep going, just like it is, you know. So you got to think about the inequity of these school systems out here too, which Patterson, is another Patterson thing Patterson Public that Schools made. is about six hundred million, five hundred, six hundred million dollars a year. A lot of money, right? Five hundred, six hundred million dollars a year, and the superintendent had to go to the public to ask businesses to donate to give kids. A computer. So I know how it feels on the other side. I, I, I feel you. I, I'm saying out of 600, 500, 600 million dollars, the local tax base, my father was on the board for over 20 years as well. He was the deputy mayor of Patterson. You know, <laughs> um, the local tax base, if I'm not mistaken, now contributes 50 million, maybe? It, it, it between 29 to 50 million in a 500 million dollar, 600 million dollar budget. Where's the other money coming from? You ask. We know where it comes from. It comes from state, federal government, mostly state. 
So folks who are working, living, doing their job and going to work every day, raising their families, they put in their taxes are coming out and that money is going where? To Patterson, Passaic, North. And we get a 50% graduation rate from that? So folks are saying, why are we sending this money? What's the return we get on that money? And at the same time, they still don't have enough computers to give the kids in and in, in, in when there's a pandemic. I get it, I get, I get that. But let's think, let's think differently. Let's think, how did we get in this position? We think that, we, that these young people don't want better for themselves, they want better. They truly do. Go ahead. What I'm saying is, let's stop asking for help and let's help ourselves. Let's teach our kids how important education is because I understand what you're saying as far as your scholarship. Right now, that isn't the case. So, so let's let's just the, teach the, them. The, right? the, the, the education level, right? Mm -hmm. The black kids and the white kids are learning the same things in the school, but they're learning different things at home. Absolutely. So let's talk about home. Let's talk about home. I have, a, I have students 16 years old. They come to the school, they meet, they have a baby. They're in an alternative school. They're doing very poorly to some degree in school. They have a baby with 15 years is now going to be my student. The, the father gets arrested. The mother is 16 years old. Selling drugs, making money, trying to make money. But but you, it's easy to point the finger at the victim. Where, who taught them? You're telling me what you did with your kids. Who taught them? Do we want to go around the room and say, everybody tell me who's your father and what they're doing? No. African American yeah. no, I think versus yeah. other? Do, 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 do we want to do that? So you want to put the, the weight of the world. Right, but, right. right. Yeah, and, I'm at, and I'm telling you about the home. The home, there's no one home. You know, the fathers are in jail. The mother is working 10 jobs if she's working or she's crack addicted. What happens to that baby when a pit bull is raising that kid? Let me, let me, let me, let me interject, let me interject to, to, to combine both points. So Uncle Jason, you're next, you're next right after this. So who, whose family, of the black people, how many of you, your family is one generation from maybe public housing or or um, or poverty? How many generations from poverty? Of, of, of the, of the, uh, the, the white folks here, whose family is one or two generations away from poverty? Like public housing, poverty, or two, two, three generations? Three generations? So I think, I think to the point, I, I think there's a, there's a point between both of you right now, right? And and I think the bigger the issue for the conversations at home happening in the house, mm. they can't happen if, no, if no one knows. You don't know. You don't have. You have no access to to have those inner conversations. Um, Uncle Jason, come up. You up? You up next? Oh, you up next? Okay. Yeah. okay. okay. Yeah. 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 And 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 I think and I think they have to happen as both yeah. for interest, right? Both the for interest is, is, is right. in school. Right. With who? With your administrators and your teachers. And who are my teachers? Who are my administrators? Right. Yeah. Who is that conversation happening with? That conversation may happen with you. The kid is coming to you asking me, what am I to do? He won't come to me, he'll come to you. I'm not in the schools. I'm telling you, I'm the teacher, I'm the principal, and I'm saying they're not in the class. I'm not in the classroom. Well, the central program of the kids, the person that they're going to don't understand what the kids going to do at home. It's an anomaly. Yeah, yeah. Like they're they're like they're they're isolated. To your point, that was a good question. There are isolated situations, but it's 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 a it's a system that perpetuates itself because we don't have enough to become teachers. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's different things. It's different things. Now, I'm gonna tell you. You know, I'm, I'm a scholar and a gentleman. Now, Brother John, the Saint Elder John, got up here and said the thing about Tulsa, very relevant. But now, here's the scary thing about you. Would you be offended if I asked you to share your age? You and when did you find that out about the Tulsa? How recent? Yeah. So no, let's, let, in the spirit of specificity, can you give me a number? Can you say a year, a month? Oh. Okay, and you seventy-seven. Do y'all do? Are you catching what he? Are you catching my point? He just found that out. He's seventy-seven. So no, no, no. Get, get, get receive this. No, 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 no. Hear me out. 
I'm going by what you. No, 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 no. But here's yeah, yeah, my, yeah, yeah. no, here's my point, right, sir. Right, right. You, he, he's an older senior gentleman. He's gone through schooling. He's older than me for certain. And he went through his whole schooling experience without knowing that information. And I'm telling you, as a person who's an African American studies minor, I didn't receive that either. So that speaks to, again, we've done a lot as a people that have been omitted and have been deliberately not taken, you know, have, have not been exposed to. So uh, I, I feel like you're getting, you feel, no, no, you're getting no, a little, no, hold on, hold on, hold on a second. I feel like you're getting a little upset. And Brother John, I didn't mean to offend you, but, but I wanted to just convey a certain point. The fact that you just found that out very recently, and you're, you're a senior gentleman, you've been around a long time, and how long have you lived your life without knowing that? So I'm just speaking to the educational component. That's, that's, all, that's what I'm speaking, and I'm telling you, as a person who is an African-American studies minor, I, I didn't even learn that. But, okay, I'm gonna tell you something. I'm gonna tell that's a valid question, sir, and I'm gonna address it. Now, one of the reasons we can't duplicate it is because there's an inequity. Now, what do I mean when I say there's an inequity? When some of our brothers and sisters who don't look like us, when they come over here to, 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 to start businesses and establishments and franchises, when you come from when you come from Kosovo. You have no you, you have no Equifax. Oh, let me say that again. Yeah. You have no Equifax. What is, you have no TransUnion. No, they, they, they don't have that over there. My daughter was over in Kosovo. They called the nigga over there. No, they don't have that over there. But when they come over here, you know what they get? Tabula rasa. Now you might not know what that is. It's Latin. It means clean slate. Yep. So now where's us who may have damaged credit, damaged credit as indigenous residents? We're, we're, we're not given the favorable terms as the coastal people coming from Kosovo, so when it comes time to setting up a business, they can get the resources. No, so, 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 so now, so now, we have to educate our kids about why they need good credit. How can we educate? Time out, time out, time out, time out. You're saying, not, not, Arshin, what I want you to do, Arshin, no, listen to me, sir. I want you to, I want you to get meta, metacognitive. I want you to think about what you're thinking. Now, if he already stated that the person who's par parenting the child is 16 years old, the premise we can operate from is he or she doesn't know that information. Yeah. So if he or she doesn't know that information and they're going to a school and they don't feel comfortable having a dialogue with somebody who looks different from them, where are they supposed to get that information? Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. Oh, but I'm saying even if they even if they asked, even if they asked, it's like. Yeah. So I just want, you, I'm just trying to get you to understand, because a lot of people, a lot of times, are, 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 are other people say, well, why can't the blacks do what other people do? It's because we're being held to a different standard. That's no, why. No, no, no. no it wasn't blacks. The blacks did it already. No, but what I'm saying. So how did the blacks do it in 1921? He's saying during yeah. that time. And how did the blacks do it? Do it? No, no. And he, he said, said, why can't it be duplicated? Well, the model, what you said. The model that, right. that I, made I it. I understand. I heard him. But I'm just, I'm telling you some of the things that are preventing that from coming to fruition. I heard you very clearly. You, I mean, it was a good point. I think, I think, I think simply, simply put, it's not, it's not, it's, there are, there are still constraints. There are newer constraints that, that that's, that's make, it, to, make, it, yeah. make it, make it, make it, make it. And again, to my point, if you remember earlier, I don't know if you heard me, I said, those of us, those of you who are in power, our Caucasian brethren, when you are in your respective environments where we are not present and the opportunity comes for you to have a conversation to promote empowerment, to promote equity, to promote fairness and justice so that we can have some more equity in society, that's how you get that done. Right, but he said, Jason, one of the things to answer his question is credit. You mentioned the credit. Equifax, TransUnion, it's like when, they, when you come over here, you get a t it doesn't matter what. You could have been a, 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 a drug lord in your place of residence. You come over to this country, they don't know that. You get a social security number, you get a, you get a fresh start. It doesn't even matter what you did over there. You come over here, you, 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 you starting fresh. But where some of us, a lot of us who are you know African American, we don't necessarily have that teaching about the importance of having a good credit score and the advantages of how you can get a, a house easier and better. Well, we better. Are, where, where were the kids taught that? Because it wasn't in school. They don't teach that in school. 
So it goes back yeah, to the some, edge. Some well, school, now. Some, some schools well, now. See, come on. They teach business math. They teach no, financial, no, okay, business financial math, literacy. But the of so your question is, English. we need to infuse financial literacy. Yes. Yes. Starting from third okay. grade okay. Yes. until yes. Oh, she, but you know, oh, she, you do, do you know who would do that? You know who be who would be responsible for that? Oh. The people who make the curriculum. The people who can say this is what's acceptable. This is what children need. The people who make the curriculum are Houghton Mifflin yeah, and those yeah, big yeah. companies. They make the curriculum. And, and okay? you can talk about the law you want. There's a law on the books, and I, and I wanted to get back at that. The law is on the books now, and it is not happening. But now we can have a large argument about a mayor who makes a law say put on a mask. Oh, we could discuss that. We got to get rid of that. If they issue a law, it must be followed, right? When is, when is, when is to whose benefit? What's the law? Okay. Start? So what the, what the, the law, law says? Right? The law states that every uh, 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 educational institution in New Jersey must infuse African American history into all subjects. Okay. Math's not all subjects, and is not being done. How old is the law? Well, twelve years old. Yeah. So, and so, and, and so. And, and I wanted to just address one more point. I'm sorry, I don't want to go. Uh, we talked. I, yeah, he's right next. But that institutional racism piece, and we talked about. You know, again, if you work with law enforcement, one of my uh, close friends are, is an ally. He's law enforcement 25 years. He works in the school with me. Some of these folks don't believe they work for a system. Even as an African American chief, there are certain things that you can't do as chief because these things are already uh, uh, systematically in place. For instance, the President of the United States, they should be able to say or do what they want, right? We see now, this President says and does whatever he wants. Carefree. Barack Obama says, Trayvon Martin could be my son. Oh, whoa, whoa, what, 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 oh, no. Trayvon Martin could have been my son. Was that such a terrible thing to say? All he's saying is I can relate to this kid. I'm African American, he's African American. That could have been my son. They wanted his head for making a statement like that. But lo and behold, you listen to Donald Trump and stuff that comes out of his mouth, why is there not the same type of outrage so, 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 toward him? Hold on, Dr. Zimmerman said about passion and anger. What infuriates me, my anger and passion, is that Marianne Clausen in Oakland, New Jersey, I drive down two hours from North Jersey or from South Jersey to visit her to, to get some to get some knowledge. I'm getting stopped, sir. I'm getting stopped and she can tell you I have to call her on the phone, let her know where I am. What's going on is the constant, consistent harassment. And then as he's mentioning about the president, when, 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 when black folks or when the president that we used to have dealt with all these questions, the ethical piece for our current president is yeah. not looked at in the same regard. So when you wake up and people say, uh, why are you angry? Why are you angry? When I think about Tulsa, I think about how we were striving and I think about how white men and women burned up and burned down that thriving community. Yeah, I'm a little unsettled sometimes. When I go to Marianne for help and knowledge, right, and I'm driving down, whether it's North Jersey or South Jersey, just for a little knowledge, and I'm harassed by police officers, and I have to call her about my well-being, I've done nothing wrong. Sir, I have to recalculate how I go home. When I get outside, I have to recalculate where I need to go so I don't see any officers. Damon can share with you, from the age of eight or nine years old, I'm on my college campus where I was working and I'm getting harassed. Guns pulled upon me. Guns pulled on my son. This is a trend. Guns pulled on my, my, my mentee who we mentioned. Jason Field is my brother. Damon Merkinson is my son. Arsene Giles mentioned my family and I was his 
I guess his, his mentor, his yeah. his leader. But it shouldn't have been that way. I could be that, but it shouldn't have been me per se. But I'm saying to you, sir, I have to navigate a lot to get to A to B, just not to deal with that harassment. And it's and unfortunately, what, what scares me, my peers that look that look like me who don't have the patience that I have, they're dying. They don't live to see another day. And it's not that they don't want to, they don't have the patience to sit there and navigate through all that harassment. So that's what bothers me because in my heart, we hosted this together to be able to talk about this. Damon, four degrees, my son, Arsene understands. We're in this, just like you're in this, as citizens wanting to see better, but we gotta continue to have the conversation, but we'd say something in our, our group called Men Stepping Up, there's action steps that have to happen. What is going to happen when we leave here to take some action so we have got something sustainable that we can look at, as you stated, to say, this helped the problem? Do we have some dates? Do we look at policy and say, can we get together and go down the trend together as family and say, we are standing up for this? Something that they haven't been able to do in 12 years in Congress and agree on something else. I don't care if you're a Republican, independent, or a Democrat. There's certain things that we are aligned on that we need to get better. So we need to figure out how to do that. No, I mean, like I said, me personally, I'm just solution oriented. And that's why I've said what I've said. I already told you, I, 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 already, I already gave you the script. I, I, as, as our European, I said, when you go back to your respective environments, where we are tempted to tend not to be represented, speak up, empower, promote, advance our cause, advance our representation in these respective arenas the where we- Somehow, our white brother needs to, if you believe and understand what you receive from this conversation, go back to your, 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 your white friends and peers and say, hey, listen, yep. there's certain things that they have a point about. Yep. Don't talk to me like I'm crazy when I'm the one, do, do the math, 165 days in a year, 180 days in a school year. Out of 180 days in a school year, I'm stopped at least twice a year since the time of 17. And then say I don't have a right to be upset or on edge. That's real. So we have to talk about that, understand that, so when you see the next Eric Floyd or anybody who's acting like they're resisting arrest, I have a right to be fed up. I'm not guilty, but I'm treated as if I'm guilty. So just understand what goes through. Why didn't he just resist? Or why didn't he just comply? Now what's going on, we can comply and still be dead. You can have your hands up and still be killed. You can walk with your back turned and still be murdered. See, but the, old, the old adage is a picture's worth a thousand words. See, people are enraged, and rightfully so, because they actually saw what happened to Eric Floyd. But as quiet as it is, it's kept. Breonna Taylor was murdered in her sleep. She was asleep when they killed her in her apartment, when they went into the wrong place. People don't talk about that as much. They, people talk about the George Floyd because they saw it. But this thing that happened with this woman, she was in her bedroom asleep and they killed her. Rim three, sleep, and they killed her. And they went into the, people aren't talking about that as much, but she was murdered in her home. Yeah, no, you, can, you can say that, tell her family that. You know, I mean, it's like, I'm sorry. I know what you want. You can come out of my mic. Yes. Um, there's a lot of points that have been made. You hear me? No, I think the mic's on. That might be. Well, you guys are speaking. It doesn't read. It doesn't read. You hear me? Yeah. Yeah. All right. There's a lot of points been made. I'm going to speak to two right now. Um, the one, someone mentioned about racism in the police department and not believing, I believe the attorney said, not believing that there is racism in the 
Police Department. No, not systemic. Institute. Yes, not systemic. systemic. Not systemic. Okay. But I, I think um, it's a little more than that in understanding that. Um, <clears throat> it's the fear of the unknown. You have people that don't know anything about black folks or the culture or anything like that, and they're charged with policing them. And so <laughs> it's like you make me a police officer and you put me in a KKK village. Well, guess what? I'm going like this. Anything that move, I'm shooting the shit out of it. <laughs> I'm firing it. And, that, and that's what's happening. It's not so much, you know, the racism, as you say, you know, it's the unknown <laughs> factor. And so, and, and so you go further, you know, if you're gonna have white police officers in the black community, then that white police officer need to understand and know a little bit more, get rid of that fear factor, the unknown factor. They have to know what they're dealing with. No. Um, that's sensitivity training. That's what you're talking about. It's, and so, uh, and, and, and until we begin that, so hiring people for police officers to change, they have to change the way we do it. And uh, you want to be a police officer in a black community? All right, learn this community. Understand. You got to understand who you're dealing with. Because, you know, you can't be like me in the, in the KKK village. You know, I got to understand what I'm looking at and when I walk into something. Um, <clears throat> the other thing was mentioned about uh, the resources, you know, the economics, the, the wealth, the money in the community. Um, in the 60s, there was a book called The $40 Billion Negro, written by Charles Parker. And in it, he discerned and he found out. So there's, I think at the time it was $40 billion in the black community. At that time when the book came out, if you take that amount, it would be the 19th richest nation in the world. But it's how the money was expended. He found that 80% of all the grape soda sold in this country was bought by black folks. 60%, 60% of all the clothes sold in this country was bought by black folks. 55 to 60% of all the alcohol sold. So there is money there, it's how, we, how it's expended and how we use it. And then we forget about the steps, you know, there's seven levels of development. There's seven levels of everything. And the first level is always awareness. <laughs> you have to learn about your situation, find out what it is, and then you develop a plan, and then you up to the election. We did some stuff in the 60s called uh, the black political uh, process. In the 60s, we're talking about black folks getting involved with the political, with the votings and everything. And, and we learned that electoral politics was a 25 step process. First step is awareness. So you make people aware, you organize, they buy up, boom, boom, boom. Step 25, then you elect representatives. At that point, when you like people, then they understand why they're there, and they know why they're there, and they go there to do the job for your community. But all the other groups that came in and they entered the process in this country, they followed the process. But the black folks, we wanted to, we came in at step 25, electing the representatives, when we should be at step one, but in actuality, our people were at step minus one not even aware that they should be aware. So if we're really going to do our job, we, go, we have to make people aware that they should be aware, then you make them aware, then you're up and you organize, mobilize up to step 45, then you elect the person to represent you. We keep missing the, the boat. 
you know, and we get all the movements. You know, we have to take a look at what we're doing and how we do it and find out why. You know, why is that? You know, in, in, in the police the department, again, why is it that we have people that are police in the area that they don't? It's an unknown factor for them. And if it's an unknown factor, it's just like me. I got my shit. You know, breathe, I'm shooting at it. <laughs> um, and there was mentioned also, you know, the history. What I found so uh, significant, so important. You know, when, when I learned that 3,000 years, 3,000 years before Christ, Africans was doing open heart, open heart operations, eye transplants, the highest level of mathematics, 3000 BC. The story of Jesus Christ is actually the story of Horace. Horace was 3000 years earlier. The same, this Jesus Christ story is the story of Horace. That's a lot to flip in your head to try to get understanding. And then learning and understanding your true history, we need to take a page from Dr. Ben, or Dr. Ben Sertum, you know, or <laughs> the lost books of the Bible were taken out of Africa and placed in the archives of Europe. And those books were went and visited and have been discovered. If you look and study those books, you find those the real answers to what's been going on in the world. But you talking about history, knowing your history, there's so much to know. And there's so much to understand. But knowing my history, you know how proud, how that made me feel? I mean, you know, I can stand and up toe to toe to anybody. You know, I, I, no, hell no. By anything, because, you know, <clears throat> someone mentioned the truth. But realizing and understanding the truth make you stronger to fight for. But our people, both whether it's white or black or whatever, if we go on to understand this and begin to live as humans, you know, a level of playing field, but as humans, everybody's equal, then we need to go a lot back, to, you know, and, 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 and swallow some of our own. Thank you. I'm sorry. It, it didn't matter. We're all one family. And we need to start treating each other like that. Yeah. And we need to all get out and vote. And we need to realize, you know, we're, we're all in, this is our house, all of our house. And we need to, to protect our house. Right now, our house is not being protected. The Russians can interfere. We got unnamed people pulling kids off the street in Seattle and Portland, Oregon. I mean, it's just no names on them. You know, just, it's like, is this our country or what? This is not how you treat your family. We're supposed to be Americans all together. And you know, you're treating people like they're nothing. This is not a dictatorship. This is a democracy. And we need to let America, you know, live up to its creed, its honesty. You know, its original sin has to end. You know, we are all equal. Amen. <laughs> My gosh, there's so much to say. All right, all right. Um, and I don't want to ram. I, I'm afraid I'm going to ramble because. No, it's okay. You, were, right. you didn't say nothing the whole time. You got free reign. I, I came here to listen. You know, I came here to listen, and obviously, I have my own thoughts about so many of the things that were brought up. Um, and I wanted to hear from everyone because I believe that being together and talking face to face is a whole lot better than talking on Facebook. And you're going to get a lot more out. And obviously, we have a lot of passion about so many things and when we're together I can hear you when we're together I can listen and I can feel your pain I felt your pain before um, whenever I hear these stories and and you you feel compassion because you're not the only one right I mean 
black people, ha I want to, there's a difference in my mind between equality of opportunity and equality of outcome, right? And I can't help equality of outcome. I can help it in some ways. I can help it because if I see somebody who needs a job and I know of a way that I can help them get a job, that's what I do. <laughs> that's what I do for people. I see people who need a job and I help them find something. I would like nothing better than to see an opportunity and be able to help. Um, I hear, um, I want to find ways that we can feel together again. And this is helpful to me. This I love. I love this. I love reaching out and actually touching people. Because what I hear is a lot of anger. I, I love what you were saying. I keep forgetting her name. I'm Arshin. sorry. Arshin. Arshin. What can the black community do to help the black community? Because I feel awfully condescending when I feel like only white people can help the black community. And I get really annoyed with other white people who say, you need to be the one who helps the black community because they're not able to help themselves. And I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. Um, and we talk about fear. And I hate that you feel afraid of the police. That is horrible. It's horrible. Um, the choice of my fear is not what they can do to me. It's what I can do to them and what I can get away with after I, after I make the act to defend myself, I have to process, I'm going to leave a family, a generation, peers, because I'm going to lose my life. So I have to I have to contemplate, do I fight for my life in this moment? Because I may lose it anyway. Mm. That's the fear. Uh, I'll tell you a little story about my fear, right? right? I came home from sixth grade. My parents grew up in, I was born in Newark, right? So they, they met in Newark. And I came home in sixth grade. We were already living in Avenel. Yeah. And, um, and my mom was there with her aunt that she had gone to Newark to go pick up. And she didn't have the teeth on the side of her face. I said, what happened? She said, I got mugged today. And my mother could scream. <laughs> so she said, I screamed and I threw my purse. I threw my purse, but they still punched me in the face. And you know what was worse than getting mugged and punched in the face? There was a group, Beth, of black guys right across the street that were construction workers. And all they did was say, wow, that white bitch can scream. And she said, you need to be careful when you walk down the street of Newark. You need to watch it. And my son from Stockton, California, he spent three years in school there. And I prayed every day he wouldn't get hurt. He was shot at, or his, I, I shouldn't say he was shot at, his car was shot at when he was at a fraternity party because people wanted to come in. And, and There are reasons to be afraid. There are reasons why you're gonna hold your gun and be scared. Right? And we're not talking about that piece of it. We're saying, what can white people do? And I want to know what white people can do. I do. But I want to know, I want to have the whole conversation be held. What can black people do too? And I want to help black people help themselves because that can be done. Now, I also heard good stories about why that's a problem, right? Nobody taught you about credit. Okay, what can we do? When we talk about, I'm glad that you defined racism the way that you did, right? Because that's not how I defined it. I defined it like, am I treating you differently because you're a different color? Am I acting a different way? And, and I would say, I'm trying really hard to treat everybody with love, with kindness, with, you deserve the respect of being a human being, right? And as long as you're not harmful to me, I'm not harmful to you. And I still think that's a good way to live. Yeah, really? No. Um, Anyway, I'm starting to lose my train of thought. But at the end of the day, there's a lot of tearing down our country, which I think is not an original sin. I think the country is founded on really good ideas. They just didn't live up to them. No, I didn't say that. The ideals made it. The original sin was to bring a, a group of people from another country in chains and, and, con and continue to subjugate them, whip them because they didn't follow the rules, because they didn't understand the language. I told you to pick up that log and you didn't do it, so I'm going to whip you. 
but I don't know your language. You know, there was, there's so many steps along the way. And it takes generations to fix that. And it takes us helping each other to fix that. I want to know today what laws, and I think this is what Albert was getting at because we talk sometimes. Um, what laws, when we say, is there still systemic racism? Is there still a law? Now, not, that's not how you defined it earlier, right? Systemic racism. Oh. The way we're looking at it is, is there a system, a law, something that is holding people back that needs to be changed? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, One like, thing I just want to say to that is that when you see two teams, a white team and a black team, in front of a judge, the exact same crime. And over 57% of the time, the black team gets five times as much time. I've never seen that in Hunterton County where I live. I'm not doubting you. But where I live in God's country, we don't have that at all. If anything, the white kid will get kicked better because he should know better. That type of an attitude. I, and I just want to say thank you for listening to me because I feel like if under normal circumstances, if I say anything like this, I'm going to get canceled. No, 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 no. Uh, Let me just say uh, thank you for your transparency. You know, but what I wanted to say is like, and as it as as the, as if we, if we want to talk about the legal ramifications, let I don't know if you remember. I have a ve I have a very good memory. Could you address something that Beth said though? Beth made a comment about you were founded and it was a good thing. Yeah. And See, see, but this is the thing. See, to, to speak to that, you know, in, in, in the Bible, there's a verse that says the spirit gives life, but the letter kills. Nominally, in word, the, 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 it, it may have been founded in a certain way, but in terms of implementation, and now you remember, when this country was 157 years old, 1776, we were still in the throes of slavery. So now when you say... When, you took, when, when we look at this thing historically from the historical context, from its inception, this country was, it was built on the foundation of racism. And so, so, so just, for the, just for the record, so it wasn't like it was built with egalitarianism and somehow racism crept in. No, it's very, it's very inception, the very foundation, it was racism from the inception to that. But now, I don't know if you remember this. It's an obscure detail. Maybe none of you remember it. I'm, they, they, I'm, in some circles, I might be considered a genius. But there was a case where they found arsenic in a grape from Brazil many years ago. You know what the country did? They stopped importing grapes from Brazil. They found arsenic in one grape. They stopped the importation of grapes from Brazil. Yeah. Now, 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 contextually, let's think about this. Brothers and sisters, black people, we don't own a whole lot of boats. So when you talk about the drug distribution in this country, it's a billion dollar business and it's tax free. That's not us. That's not us. But when it comes to, as the attorney, when you see people in front of the judge for these petty crimes for selling two and three vials, who do you see? You see African-American men and women standing before the judge saying, you're getting four, four years or 40 years, three strikes, you're out. All the, but what about these people who own the very ships? We don't own the ships. So can, if somebody can help me out with that, please. How is it these, if you can stop grape importation for arsenic found in one grape, one single solitary grape, but you can't you can't stay the, the whole drug importation business? And then when, when crimes are being committed, you're telling me that it's us? No, what we do is, it's, Ronald Reagan said it's trickle down economics. No, they're selling the big stuff, we selling the little rocks. But they're not getting prosecuted for, the, for, for, for bringing in these large tons of, of cocaine. We getting prosecuted on Prince Street, on Main Street for the little stuff. But for the big stuff, nothing happened. Somebody, you know, somebody help me with that. Thank you. Well, you're angry, and you raised some good points, and I'm not arguing with that. I'd like to say this, though, that uh, we have talked about a lot of the fallacies, the terrible things that happened to black people. You know, they also happen to other people too, but you're kind of noticeable. 
uh, I'm sure the Irish would say, uh, yeah, you know, I'm an Irishman, I'm a Polish, Polak, you know, whatever I am, doesn't matter. So it, 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 it really affected you, but I still feel that our country was founded on fundamental principles that will benefit all of us. John, go back. That our country... No, no, no. No, you, no. right there. When you want no anger, anger is dismissing, well, Prolox, Jews, this one, that one, whatever, uh, they had some issues too, is when you denounce, when you make light of, when we make, when we don't make a strong emphasis that, hey, it's not the same what happened with the folks and black folks. And when you make light of it, to say that just others that had the same thing, it's not the same. I, so that's I agree. that passion. Yeah, no. You get my I, point though? Your point's well taken. Okay. I'm yeah. saying though that no matter how you look at it, this country was founded upon principles. The principles. Principles only yeah. that pertain to us today, all of us. Although no, not all of us the same. No, no, no. Let me finish. But we're not followed. No, no, you're not letting me finish. Okay, I'm sorry. That we're not. Now, see if I can get my thought again. This country was founded upon principles that are fantastic in word, in word only. Now, let's talk about the Declaration of Independence. Okay. We hold these truths the to be self evident. Right? Right? That all white male property owning men are created equal. Think about it. White, property owning, men. That excludes women, non-property owners, blacks, etc. So, point being, the principle sounded good on paper, but it was fallacious in its enactment because it applied not to you, not to me, nobody, unless you were a, a southern Thomas Jefferson or something of that. Ilk. But in spite of all that, people are clamoring to get into this country. For sure. They want to come to this country. So I admire you, all of you, because you're trying to find a solution. And it's not just anger. And I admire when you get angry. I love it. You should. You, you should get it. Both you guys were so dynamic in what you're, what you're Passion. saying. Passionate. Passionate. That's good. Yeah, you were just, you were wonderful the way you said it. But what I'm trying to say to you, before I depart, what I wanted to say to you is, people want to come here. And what we're trying to do today is what pisses me off about Trump, Obama, Bush, Bush, I'll go all the way back. We've had killings of black people. We've had killings of people all over the place. What do we do about it? Nothing. Give me your vote. Give me your vote. We'll deal with it. It's time you stop giving the vote away. When I look at what goes on in Chicago, what bothers me is, and again, I don't understand it. I'm looking at things through a white eyes. I grew up in a lower middle class family. You know, I didn't have to worry about the cops. I grew up in Pennington where Mar Marianne and, and, and John uh, grew up. We all grew up in that area. It was God's country. Everybody was good. Everybody lived fine. We didn't worry about stuff, but if we went into Trenton, we would get hurt because Trenton was a very dangerous city then. It still is. So what I'm saying is, I want to go back to you because I really, you affected me. We need to educate the children. I can't think of your name, the gentleman next to you. Nice man. Arsene. the Arsene. You see, I don't use these names very often, so you got to understand. Albert, Liz, Beth, Gary, Arshina, you were right through them. But, you know, the issue is, what do you do, what are you going to do when you go back? The family doesn't exist. You've got a family. You're a father, mother, children. You've got a family. That's a wonderful thing. What do you do with these kids that don't have it? So what do you do? That's where the schools have to take charge. And loco parentis, you used the phrase before, right? So that's what you said. We need the schools to become their parents. Somebody's got to do it. Otherwise, what are you going to kiss them goodbye? You can't do that. And it's wonderful what you do for these kids. It's incredible. You've got to keep doing it. So my point being, simply put, this country is a great country. It's a wonderful country. We deserve, let's make it better. And let's not dwell on the past, but let's dwell on now the future. And you guys are doing it. And I love that. And I, I don't understand all your stuff about stages and all. I, I really no, that wasn't me. That was him. Not, well, you and I, do I ask you a question? Would you defund the police? No. Thank you. 
you'll teach them better. You'll teach them how to become better police officers, understanding police officers, and that's what you should do. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I agree with that. Yeah, sensitivity. I, I, I don't, I, listen, I, listen, my thing is, if, sir, if I could just real quick before you say ahead. something. This is my, this is my thing. Uh, they have this thing, I don't know if you know about it because it's not your genre. I do because it is mine. Like we're teaching, they have this thing, it's called the Teacher Next Door Program. Whereas if you live in the neighborhood, you can buy a house in the neighborhood for like a discounted price. But you have to live, you have to teach in that neighborhood. You have to live there. So I'm saying along the same lines, you know, again, if you're going to police a community, you need to live in that community. Because to me, that changes the whole conversation. Because now you're less likely to murder somebody who's your neighbor. And you're going to see their mother and you're going to see their father at Stop and Shop. But when you're allowed to work somewhere and live somewhere else and you don't you don't respect the demographic that you're policing that's how you have these incidences after that most of the people that become cops which we know are normally the black cops in our community most of them were worse than the white cops because of because of what they're taught why when they're a cop right but if we teach the youth educate them no it's cool to be a cop so that way you do police your own community legally versus say why are they coming in doing this we're letting them it's not that we're letting them we don't have a choice because we aren't doing it ourselves but I not I'm thinking that we want to reallocate sources so that the police may not, like some of these cases, you know, you need to send a social worker in. You don't need to send six police armed to the gills. You know, that that's, so allocate funds to go to different departments that will address community policing. To just send in cops with a militaristic attitude oftentimes escalates and makes the situation worse. I, That's I, what I look at I, when I, I say defund the police. I can't argue with you, but I will say one thing. I've seen the police go into domestic violence cases, alcohol's involved, violence, kids are there. You got to de-escalate it immediately or somebody's going to get killed. So yes. I've, I've had experience Listen, with that. You've had experience with that? Yes. I've lived that. You live it. Okay, then. So, I mean, I'm not saying so that. I'm not an advocate for defund. I, I know firsthand the, the, the ramifications and repercussions of, of having a mom get a bloody nose at her father's hand. I, I, that was me. So I'm not by any means saying we shouldn't have police because to me that's that's anarchy. Right. No, but the police, when they're in a certain community, if they're gonna police in that community, they need to A, get extensive desensitiv desensitivity training about the culture of the community where they'll be policing, or B, live in that community. No, no, that would be stupid. No, I'm gonna tell you straight up, that would be stupid to say we don't need cops. No, that's that's stupid. No, but what we do need, if we want to stem these, these these horrific incidences of people getting murdered and maimed, you know, by police, we need to really revisit the hiring practices of these police. Men and women who are going to be police in these respective and communities. Crazy, what about the unions that protect the police? You cannot get the information from one cop to another. If he's committing right. oh, something wrong, you don't get the information. That's wrong. Yeah. There should be a national bank where if you're charged with a, a, a assault, assaulting somebody on your job, it's in there. It's in that. Yeah. that yeah. But, that's right. But, that's but right. what you're speaking to, yeah. sir, again, that speaks to policy. Yeah. You know, that's that like this is that would be a policy that we need. I'm sorry, yeah. I, I oh I'm sorry. It's, it's his turn. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, yeah. I, I heard a lot of situations. I appreciate that. And I think some of what we need is solutions. And it touches on a couple of things that were stated like stated like about absentee fathers. Uh Sometimes the fathers are, sometimes they're killed by other blacks, sometimes they're killed by police, sometimes they're incarcerated because of, because of uh, drugs. Absentee fathers, that, I share my experience. I, 31 years ago, almost 32 years ago, I was smoking crack. I was a crackhead. 
and I got I had a, a daughter I was raised in a, in a good family and and I went out and prayed one night and I said I don't I'm, I wasn't raised like this I don't want to live like this a couple weeks later uh, my family ganged up on me and got me into rehab and the rest is kind of like history I've, I've, I've done a lot of nice things in the past 31 years anyway my daughter was nine at the time and I got custody of her. She had a brother, she's got a brother, two and a half years older than her. And he always looked at me as a father because when I took her shopping, I would take him shopping too because I don't think two, two siblings should be treated differently. Like one get something and the, the other one doesn't get as much. I'd take them shopping to the point where one time she says, well, Dad, why don't you get stuff for me first? Since, uh, I'm your daughter, he's not even your son. But I treat them both equally. So when I got clean, I got custody of my daughter, and he looked at me, looked to me as a father figure. So I says, I have to step up to the plate and be the, the father that he thinks I am. So I took custody of him also. He was a troubled child. Uh, he wasn't good in school. One time I found, and I'm a recovering addict, one time I found an ounce of marijuana in the bureau. Uh, he stole stuff from me like, it was a growing experience for me, as well as him. Now, I heard situations, the, the solution is this. He was kind of a throwaway kid. Like, he wasn't doing good in school. I tried to help him. He wasn't responding. Now, he'll be 42 shortly. He got, he saw me. I was his role model. Like, he didn't see how I was before, but I was his role model. Now, he's, he's moved to Indiana. He's, he, he did have, he was praising himself because he hadn't been in jail in like six years and no warrants. He, he got a car, he's got a job, and they're, they're offering him, uh, he's got a retirement program. And I say all this to say this, that I appreciate you educators. You say you sponsored six people? I appreciate that too. It doesn't have to be that you become a politician and help the whole community or or a school district, you can do one-on-one -on -one like me. And to, to me, I kind of I, I kind of think I saved his life. Like he could have been in jail or mm -hmm. dead right now. And I'm so happy that that I was used by God to set to to be a role model for him, so he could be he watched me, and he's doing what, he's repeating what I'm doing. So that's a solution. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, I guess we, we're getting ready to wrap up. So um, thank everybody that's here that came and spoke. Appreciate you all your time.